I'm going to speak in English to everybody so that uh, I can speak to people who are also watching us live because we are filming live. Uh, and Greg is going to be translating. So hopefully you guys will be able to understand what he's saying. We're here in Panahachel in Lake Atitlan and we are getting ready to launch our Go Roughly Around the World adventure. In our audience here, we've got all of our lovely artisans, their girls, and their friends as well. So they're out here to support, to say hello, and see how everything is working here. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, uh, I'm Jess Stone. I am the founder of Roughly. Uh, and we make ethical outdoor dog gear and that's who all of these lovely artisans are. They are the ones who actually create all of the wonderful macrame for the dog products that we sell online. So they are here in Panahachel, they're from the neighboring towns as well and uh, they do such fantastic work and it's, it's been such a pleasure working with them because they are just, they're so good at their jobs um, and such wonderful people. So I'm really glad that we're able to support them and bring their traditional methods to dog products for people all around the world. <laughs> so go roughly around the world. The reason why we're doing it is because we want to raise money for a nonprofit that helps girls. It's called Girl Up, and they were founded by the United Nations Foundation, and their goal is to provide leadership and development training to girls all around the world. They work in 120 countries, they've helped over 90,000 girls. And so they provide this training to the girls to give them the confidence they need. They give them skills about how to advocate to their local government or to their communities for the issues that matter most to them. And it's such an important thing to be able to start the girls when they're young to be able to be leaders in their community and understand what it means to take a stand and do something uh, for themselves and their communities. So they are here in Guatemala as well. They have Girl Up Clubs is what they call them. And these are groups of girls that have come together that have leaders and they're the ones who talk um, and provide the training to, to their group. Um, and and so they are here in Guatemala in the Alta Vera Paz, and they've got, I think, two clubs in Guatemala City. And the cool thing about this trip is that while we are on this, this round the world trip, we are gonna be able to visit Girl Up clubs along the way. So we'll be visiting them in Mexico, in the US, in Canada, and then in Africa, and in Europe, and all of the places that we're going. So that's gonna be a really cool uh, way to sort of show the girls something that they might not have seen before and also to um, see what they've been doing and the support that Girl Up has been able to provide them. <laughs> Greg is translating. <laughs> <laughs> oh good, good. Um, what do I want to say about our trip? So our trip starts today. In one hour we will be leaving Panahachel. And we've been in Panahachel for five years. We've lived here for five years, almost six years. And we are heading off together. I will be riding this bike right here. Uh, this bike has done, I think about, what did I say, 60,000 miles. 60,000 miles on this bike, and we're going to be doing many more on this trip. And, the, and from here, the route that we're going to take, we'll start here in Panahachel in about an hour's time, and we're gonna go north. We'll go to Mexico. And then from Mexico, we'll go to the United States. And the goal is to get to Alaska. 
so the top of Alaska. And then we will come down through Canada and we will go across Canada and then we'll go to Toronto where my family is. And from there, we will fly from Toronto all the way over to Spain. And then from Spain, hopefully by then the border will be open so that we can take the ferry across. And then we will go from Spain into Morocco. And then from Morocco, we will go down West Africa. We will go down to South Africa. And then we'll go back up the east side and then through Sudan, hopefully, and then through Egypt, and then from Egypt, we go into Europe. And then we'll be in Europe for the spring and summer of 2023. And then from there, we will go east. And we will go east to, um, we'll take the more southern route, we'll go through all of the stands, and then we'll go through India and Nepal, and we'll continue through to China, and then we will go south, and we will go through Malaysia and Singapore, and then from Kuala Lumpur, uh, we had met a, cu a couple who were, uh, a German couple, who actually did a similar trip, and they were able to ship their bikes and uh, themselves uh, from Kuala Lumpur uh, down to, to Argentina. So that is going to be our path. So from Kuala Lumpur, we'll go to Buenos Aires in Argentina, and then we'll ride all the way back up. We'll cross the Darien Gap between Colombia and Panama, and then we will end in Guatemala. <laughs> so it's a long trip and we've never done anything this long before it's the first time that we have done something longer than eight months uh, so this is going to be a, a, a challenge but we are going to do it and the cool thing about it is it's not just Greg and I Moxie is coming with us Moxie, we is from uh, uh, Santiago Atiblan, just across the lake. It's like we're just over there. <laughs> and we got her um, about five years ago, right? Soon after we arrived in Panajachel. I had always wanted a dog, but just never was in a place to get one. Mainly because I was working overseas and we were traveling a lot. And so it took a while until I was able to finally get one. Uh, but when we came to Panajachel, it was just like the perfect opportunity to get a dog. So we, we saw that there was <laughs> we saw that there was a um, American guy who brought his two German shepherds from the U.S. and brought them over to uh, Lake Atitlan in Santiago, and he was breeding them, and this was the first litter. And when I saw that he was selling them, I told Greg we had to have one. And I've always wanted a big dog, not just a small one, I wanted a big one. But the challenge there is, okay, so now I've got this big dog, but we only have two motorcycles, and we don't have a car, and we like to travel, so what are we going to do? And that's how we designed the K9 Moto Cockpit. So roughly build ethical outdoor dog gear, so collars, leashes, beds, bandanas, all of that. <coughs> Excuse me. But one of the products that is a bit unique that we have is the K9 Moto Cockpit. And we designed this so that specifically, so that Moxie could come along with me on our adventures. And Moxie is a 75 pound dog. I knew that she was gonna be big when I got her. She was, uh, her dad was 120 pounds and her mom was 90 pounds. So I knew that she was gonna be big. And there were no, uh, no carriers like this on the market. And so we decided that we needed to create something. So we worked with a local metal shop and the local metal shop uh, worked with us to create this design that was open air, that allowed for a lot of airflow, that was secure and safe. And that's what we came up with for the K9 Moto Cockpit. And this is what Moxie is gonna ride in around the world. <laughs> Greg 
Greg is telling the story of how I always wanted, uh, there were two puppies, two female puppies. I knew I wanted a female. There was Moxie and there was White Paw. White Paw, I absolutely love. Uh, she was beautiful. She was the best looking out of all of them. Uh, and when we went in there, White Paw couldn't give a crap about me. She just ran away from me. She wanted to go sniff other things. Meanwhile, I had little Moxie like trying to come at me and wanting to love me. And all I wanted was to love the other one. Um, but it's that typical thing, like you don't choose the dog, the dog chooses you. And that's exactly what happened in this case, that Moxie uh, chose us. And I'm so glad that she did. Who knows what White Paw would ever happen to her and if, if she would have had the same temperament as Moxie to be able to do these types of things. Uh, but it, I'm so glad that I ended up picking Moxie and I'm sure Greg is too. Even though we, sh we thought that she was going to be the most submissive, she is not. She has a lot of energy, she likes to dominate other dogs, um, and she is, she's not necessarily a lover, um, but she will, uh, she will come to you and will come for pets. So that's something that uh, I'm really happy about too. So she is, she has the right temperament for this trip. You can see, uh, Take Hierro is a coffee shop that's here in Kona that was nice enough to come out and provide uh, coffees and, and smoothies uh, to the girls. Uh, so that's what uh, is being shared right now. That's what's behind me here uh, in this tent. Look at all that good fruit. is they are the same colors as our color schemes at Roughly. So we've got the Huckleberry Purple, which has the purple. We've got the Primrose Pink. We've got the Bushfire Red. We've got the Woodlands Brown and Green. And I am missing just one. I'm missing the Riptide Blue, which is over here. And the Riptide Blue. So I will be giving these out to girls and and boys along the way um, as a sort of memento of this of this experience and of this trip uh, to be part of something that's big like this um, because this is a two year trip uh, tr to raise one hundred thousand dollars for the for a girl up. So we what we thought this would be a good way for them to to remember us as we pass through. Uh, and I love that they are hand woven by our artisans here in Guatemala with our colors, our roughly colors as well. Um, and they've got the little uh, at go roughly symbol on them so that everybody can, can check us out online and, and sort of follow along. <laughs> We've got a question here. What's the question? Um, they say, how will the dog quarantining work in different countries? Will you have to wait in each new region? So that's a great question. So our biggest problem that we had with Moxie was the CDC ban that happened. Um, and that happened um, last year where they were saying that dogs that come from countries that are high risk for rabies would require a permit in order to enter the U.S. And for us, uh, Guatemala is a country that has a high risk of rabies. So what you would have to do is apply for a permit in order to enter. And that requires you doing a titter test that gets sent to the states because it has to be done by a CDC lab. So they pull the blood here, they send it to the states. Um, and then from there, uh, you have to make sure that you have all of the documentation. And it costs, uh, it was close to about like $1,000 to do all of this paperwork for her. 
And the other issue when I was looking into it is that you would have to fly. You can't go overland. There were only three airports that were open. LAX was one of them um, in order to fly. So you would have to fly from Guatemala City to, um, to LAX. So what we were thinking initially is that we would go to Mexico. Um, from Mexico, we would go up to Tijuana, as close as the border as we can. I would leave my bike there. Moxie and I would have to take a, a car, a shuttle, something to bring us back down to uh, Mexico City, where we could fly from. Then from Mexico City, we would fly to LAX together. Then we would have to get another transport for the two of us to come back down to Tijuana. We'd walk across the border. I would pick up my bike. Uh, I would I would cross the border. I would pick up my bike. I would cross the border, put Moxie back on, and then we could continue. But that is a big hoopla. So we did do something a little different, um, which I will share once we enter the USA. But so I think that I have it sorted. Uh, once we're in there, I will share what my plan was and if it worked out and if it didn't. Uh, but that's what the goal is for that. So that's one of the issues. They don't have a quarantine. The only country that I saw that uh, would have quarantine would be Australia. So Australia, depending on what country the dog is coming from and traveling from, uh, they might need to stay in like a 10 day quarantine in a, in a separate facility. And Australia isn't necessarily on our list right now just because it's another cost of flying and uh, like shipping our bikes and ourselves and Moxie. That's three whole things that need to go. Um, and I'm not sure that we're gonna do that, but we will see as we get closer to that area. But that's the only country that has quarantine issues. Um, there are some in, in um, that are in Africa that obviously requires similar things that the states requires, which are current rabies um, and then anti-flea uh, uh, anti medication and parasites um, and some certain vaccinations, um, all of which she has, um, but I haven't seen anything in terms of quarantine other than uh, Australia at this moment. But we're, we will be following that as we go along and if it requires us to do additional um, uh, blood draws and uh, making sure that she has the right vaccinations, we're, we're going to be all on that. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> so let me go back to my bracelets. And these bracelets here are, I'd like to give these out to the girls that we have here. You'll see on my wrist, okay, minus my hair tie, you will see this other bracelet. This is the knotted wristband. This one is also made by our artisans and it uses the same designs as our collars, leashes, and harnesses. So I'm wearing the primrose pink, which is mac matching what Moxie is wearing over there in, in Northern Lights. And these wristbands, all of the proceeds go to Girl Up. So if you buy one of these wristbands, 100% of the proceeds will go to Girl Up directly. Um, and this is something that we wanted to do so that people could also be part of it. Um, if you are buying a collar, a leash, and you want to match, this is a great way to do it. Um, they have an elastic inside, so men and women can wear it, big hands and small. Um, it works really well, um, and it uses all of the same hand-woven cotton that we use for collars and leashes for the dogs and the macrame that is the design that uh, we use for all of our products. So this one is, you can purchase this on our website. It's the knotted wristband. 100% of proceeds go to Girl Up. These, I have, I probably have about 2,000 right now that I have ready to give away to people along the road. Um, so they will be able to, you'll be able to see girls here in Guatemala wearing them, in Mexico, in Africa, everywhere around the world there will be people wearing them. Um, and so that's what I thought we could share um, with everybody along the way. Okay, let's let Greg catch up a little bit. Uh, two Wheels in a Tent wants to know when you're going to make it to Utah. That's a great question. So, um, <laughs> We're still finalizing some of that, but the the route into Utah, um, and I think uh, Two Wheels in a Tent, Cody, I think you're just about sort of starting out on your own rides and adventures, a husky on a husky, I think, a husky on a Husqvarna, so that's going to be exciting to follow. Um, 
I don't know if Utah, honestly, is in the plan because um, we are crossing. Jess, where are we crossing? El Paso. So we're crossing around El Paso, going from Chihuahua area. Um, there's a beautiful area to, to diverge for just a second. There's a beautiful area in, in Chihuahua State, Mexico, that is Copper Canyon, like three times bigger than, um, than the Grand Canyon. So we're crossing there, and then I think we sort of skirt the west while it's still maybe on the cool side. So Utah, we hit, we've ridden Utah in previous times. So I don't know if it's on, but hopefully... Maybe our iron butt will be on. Let me tell them about the iron butt. Okay, the iron butt. And thank goodness you get the You can translate this one for me. Okay, so one of the cool things that I want to do on Greg's birthday, which is on April 10th, we want to do an iron butt, which means it's like this association that's out there that you do 1,000 miles within 24 hours. So it's not really something that we could do here in Guatemala because the roads are, it's too slow. There's too many speed bumps. There are all the tumulos and topes and it's just too much. You can't, you can't make it a thousand miles in 24 hours. So the goal is to do that when we go into the U.S. So hopefully between New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, um, and we will be able to do a thousand miles in 24 hours with Moxie and we're calling it the Iron Tail. So that's what our plan is. And when people always ask, how long can Moxie last in the cockpit? Well, if we can do a thousand miles in 24 hours, I think that speaks for itself. Well, why don't I uh, bring Moxie up and, and show everybody how Moxie rides with me? Yeah, okay, Jessica va a hacer que suba Moxie para que veamos como es y como funciona este aparato. And we can watch in, in real time how Moxie will respond to me now because she wants to lay over there in the shade. <laughs> Moxie, come. Let's go, saddle up. Come. And saddle up. Yep. There you go. Good girl. Good girl. And so we turn her around. And now we need to get her to lay down. Moxie, sit. Sit. Good girl, all the way, lay down. Okay, so that is like that's the common Moxie thing. This is what we she get for Moxie. She wants to sit with her with her with butt her butt on the off there, uh, just hiking out. I mean, yeah. every time she is not new at this. Moxie has done this for thousands and thousands of miles, and every time that's how she wants to roll. That's our dog. That's the one we got. So she lays in her cockpit. So once we get her to this point, and then I harness her in. There's a lot of like. There are a lot of people out there who think that you shouldn't harness the dog in. That the dog should be able to leap out if there is an accident or anything like that. But for us, it doesn't make any sense because if she's not harnessed in, one, it's not safe for her, for me as a rider, uh, having her be able to like jump out at any moment. Um, the other thing is, if we are in an accident, you don't want her flinging out and going into traffic. Plus, because she's not wearing any like gear that I'm wearing, a jacket and armored thing, you're basically throwing your dog out and expecting them to be a cat and land on their feet. And that's not gonna happen if we were to go down, which we've gone down many times. <laughs> so what we do is we harness the dog in. So we harness her in the front, uh, and we use these straps that have a bit of bungee in them. So you can see here, there's a bit of bungee here. And that allows us to, uh, allows her to have some, some wiggle room. And so we harness her in the front, like that. And there in the front, she's good. And then in the back, we also harness her in. And this is important because if I do have a quick stop or anything like that, you don't want her to somersault over. So this keeps her butt down and keeps her weight nice and low. So it's not going to be up high. This, it can go anywhere. Sometimes it goes in her cockpit. Sometimes it goes out the cockpit. Sometimes it goes above the cockpit. This is what we have. Yeah, I know you want to go. And then, so she's wearing her harness. This is what the, the K9 motor harness that, that we designed and we created specifically for riding. And that's what she rides in. This is how she looks when she goes. The other thing that we put on her are her Rex specs. 
So these are uh, these are called Rex Specs. Uh, they're goggles for the dog, and they are specifically meant to protect her eyes from the wind, uh, from any dirt or debris. Because if you can see how she's laying here, when I'm sitting, she can peek out behind me. I'm a pretty good wind block, so she's not really feeling the wind coming at me, but she, uh, at her, because I'm blocking it. But she does like to sneak out the side so that she can look forward. So the goggles are really important for that. So these are, they also have UV protection. So it's, if your dog has any eye problems, they, it's not, they aren't specifically meant for being on a motorcycle. They can be used for anything. I've seen dogs wear them at the beach. Um, so in case it's sunny outside, if they have an issue, um, that works well. And Moxie, uh, she always rides with these. She doesn't always love them, especially when we're at slow speeds. She does want to try and rub them off because it's it's something that's it's not common for them to be wearing. It. They're not used to it, and um, so she does try and rub them off. But at speed, she she loves it because that allows her to peek out. We can be going 120 kilometers an hour, and she can look out, and it doesn't bother her. So we just put them on her, and she does a pretty good job of letting us put her put them on. And the funny thing is, is we pick pink uh, specifically because, especially here in Guatemala, we know that like big dogs can look mean and uh, they look aggressive. And I know that street dogs can fight uh, and people are, are, are scared of them. But by having the pink, uh, I'm not somebody who generally loved pink in the past. Uh, I thought it was a little too early. Uh, and there's a lot of motorcycle gear that's pink, so that's another story. But I purposely picked pink just to sort of soften Moxie a little bit and let people know that she's a female. Because that's another thing that we get, that a lot of people think that she's a male because she is so dark and so big um, that she looks like a male shepherd. But she is a female, and here when you tell people that she's a female, they they think that oh yeah she's lovely because she's a girl uh, there's a bit of a different uh, idea about male versus female dogs so the pink just give a little bit of a pop of color for her and it sort of tells you that she's a pink. the other question that we get a lot is about her ears about her hearing what do we do uh, on the road when we're riding does the sound not bother her the wind really it she is pretty good at hiding behind me and tucking in if it is windy out, if she's getting any of the wind from the side. But she's also a dog, and dogs can move their ears. And so you'll notice, if you watch any of our videos, if you're going at speed or there's a lot of wind, she will tilt her ears down and protect her canal herself. Um, and that's... I haven't read any studies or anything that say that like it's going to cause her uh, hearing loss. For the people who have ridden with their dogs for years and years and years, there hasn't really been anything specific that people say about it. So I think that um, this there are options out there. Rex Spex, who makes the goggles, also makes like a earpiece. It's basically a sock that goes over their head that has pads where their ears are. But since Moxie's a shepherd and her ears are sticking up, she doesn't like when they're being pushed down. So I tried it with her. Maybe I didn't do enough sensitization and training with it, but the idea would be is that it would basically cover the ears like this. That's something that we recommend for people who have really loud bikes, if their mufflers are loud. Um, mine isn't particularly loud. Um, so that's another thing that you could use. But she does pretty good here. Um, one of the things that she has for her specifically, this is her bed. This is her bedroll. How it's interest how it works for like hotels and stuff. Yeah. Didn't uh, Tracy uh, have that bed? That's right. Yeah. So one of our one of our cockpit riders was having that issue where she she pulled up to a place and uh, they wouldn't let her into the hotel because they didn't accept pets. One of the things that I normally say when we get to a place 
is one, I say she has her own bed. And that really can make a difference. When you say that she has her own bed, she doesn't, she's not gonna jump up on their bed, she's not gonna get everything dirty. This way she has a place that's her own um, that will carry with her everywhere. So that, that can help if it is a place that's not necessarily pet friendly or they're pet agnostic. Um, that's a good way to get them at, uh, feel like ease. Uh, and those, so that's what I normally recommend. So having your own bed and obviously saying that she's well behaved on occasion, um, that she she won't make a, uh, too much noise or anything like that, that seems to help as well. But that's something that we're going to have to deal with on the road in places where they won't necessarily accept pets. We will be doing a lot of camping. Uh, so we have all of our camping gear. That's what Greg carries on his bike, um, all of our camping gear. So hopefully we'll be doing a lot of camping um, during those days. <laughs> So we're in the hot sun right now. You can see that she's panting. When we're riding, she seems to, uh, she does really well uh, with the wind. That's why we built the carrier like this. We built it specifically because it is a hot place where we generally live in the sun like this. Um, so we built it so that there could be a lot of air flow. And that seems to help her a lot when we're, when we're on the road. The other thing that we do have, um, for dogs who are, um, or for people who want protection for their dogs, we do have like a sun shield that we can put on top of Moxie um, that has like a reflective material to it that has some air pockets as well. So that way it's, the sun is not directly beating on her. Um, and we use it on occasion. Um, but look, she's a, she's a big burly shepherd. Um, I think that she can handle uh, the 20 degrees or whatever we have right now. Um, it's more of when we're in really, really hot weather when it comes to like 40 degrees outside. Then we just want to make sure that she does have a lot of air But she generally can do like uh, two hours on the way at a time uh, with like a 20 minute break and just like stretching the paws and um, she does really good. <laughs> did, you, did you share a little bit about um, what you what you bring for her? So yeah, I saw I, the the sun shield we bring when it's sunny. For the rain, we have a uh, a rain fly. So basically, it's really funny. You'll have to watch our videos on a day when it's raining uh, and that uh, we filmed in the rain. Um, but she basically has like a cape that goes over the whole cockpit that's uh, waterproof and it has like a rim around the neck so that the water can like slide down and then it's got like think of like a monk or like a, a nun that has like a habit on and that's what we put over her head and it has a, a hood that is adjustable and it's got like cinches so it keeps it down and then with the rec specs it protects everything it sort of keeps it all together so she's completely covered uh, when it's raining. Um, she, I think she prefers to be without it. Like, like I said, Moxie's a dog. She's a big dog. She, she enjoys all of the different elements out there. When it's raining, she loves to be out in it. Um, but even like I know as a rider, like it's not comfortable when you're being pelted by the rain. So having some protection is good. So that's why we need to put that in her. And then in these pockets. This pocket, I have her leash, her water bowl when she's not when it's in here, um, and uh, her brush because you can see she is a shedder, and uh, her light stick. We have an LED uh, collar for her, so at night people can see her. It's bright pink. Um, and on the other side, I have her kibble bag, and her kibble bag has like 17 cups of kibble in it right now. Um, so that lasts us for a good while, and then. That looks like our BMW friends have arrived. Um, here we say the uh, Ora Chapin, like they arrive, you know, like um, like uh, Guatemala time. But welcome. <laughs> some female riders with us with them. No, Ma. 
Moxie, I know you want to see them. It's it's really so awesome. Like I don't mean to speak out of turn, but you know, in, in parts of Latin America, it's still not like a lot of women riders, right? Um, sort of like when we were in Liberia and Jess was first learning um, in Monrovia, uh, which obviously is in Africa, not Latin America, but she was like the only woman that was riding a bike. It was just this bizarre thing, and she would practice on this like this dead end alley and some people would notice whatever and then like towards the end of her practicing all of a sudden we start to notice like oh there's a young lady out there that's, that's like her boyfriend or husband or brother or whatever is, is teaching her and we notice another one it's just that small little way and the way we all kind of like connect to it. I mean it was just a little bit of a change it was just awesome so you know in Latin America there are lots of uh, amazing female riders so don't get me wrong but it's not it hasn't sort of taken off in the same way that in other places and so you know to just kind of see uh, more of it and some women coming out and like, I don't know it just makes it hard you know um, so that's that's my feel about that I love it and they're going to ride out with us in the next 10 minutes, I think. Uh, we will start heading out. We got another question. Yep. Um, if your route, will you be at Horizons Unlimited rallies in the U.S. or Canada? Yes, we will be at the Horizons Unlimited in California at the beginning of April or mid-April. So we will be there. We'll be presenting. Uh, Moxie will be there, obviously, and we'll be doing a whole to-do. So if you guys are in California, um, we'll be there. We'll also be at the ADV Get On Fest um, in uh, in the Mojave Desert uh, for uh, the Revzilla slash Rawhide uh, event. And then we will be at Overland Expo West in May in Flagstaff. So if you're at any of those events, that's where we're going to be so far. And I'm sure there's a bunch more that we're going to be popping up along the way. If you follow our um, our landing page at GoRoughly.com or GoRoughly.com slash World-Adventure, there's an event section and that's where we list all of our events. So you can sort of see where we're going to be. And, uh, uh, just kind of basking in you know the excitement of so those are my my moments but um yeah oh and now they want to be around my bike and i don't even get to be part of it right so it's basically just the uh what do i call it in spanish the burro de carga like the the mule that that carries everything um, but really like i think jess is actually more loaded down than i am did she already talk about what uh, what she's carrying she talked about what she's carrying for moxie yeah, like both of the, the bags are stuffed, the her cases are, we did a practice trip like, um, or a practice sort of hour and a half, two hours, you know, like what happens is you do a trip like this and 
like it's not until about an hour or so in that you start noticing like bolts are loosening, things are starting to rattle. You know, so you set up everything at home and everything was good, good in your garage. Like, oh, this is going to be bomb proof. This is awesome. And then like you realize that you forgot that one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where uh, you want to do like a short trip, a short little something that that is just long enough to see if anything's going to be loose. So we did that like on Tuesday, Wednesday. Everything held up like a chain. Uh, we've got like a three hour day today, so it's not going to be brutal. And then uh, tomorrow is the long one all the way to San Cristobal. And uh, then we're going to be... Are we coming to it now? 10.57. Okay, we have to settle up. So we're getting some local wisdom that La Mesilla, which is the border that we're planning to cross tomorrow, has had a few killings recently. And that Tapachula, which is a little further to the south, is a bit of a safer Sí, eso te queríamos decir que la, la frontera de la Mesía ahorita es una frontera que, está, está, que tiene muchos problemas y no es seguro salir por la Mesía. Yo lo que te aconsejaría sería que, que agarren aquí para Shela, para que Saltenango, y en Saltenango bajan a la costa y de Retabuleo agarran y salen por la frontera de Tapachula. Okay, so Alex is suggesting a little further south, that's a bit of a safer sort of route than crossing there. Nobody wants uh, trouble at the very beginning of a trip. We, we hate to sort of respond to every concern and you know, potential scare because there's no end to that. Like, everybody's heard sort of their own version of what's good and what's bad, but nobody wants to get themselves into trouble. And also, you know, it's usually sort of easier to just kind of, okay, let me take that information, let me digest it. And then based on what you're saying, what I'm reading and finding myself, and also my own experience, because we were, in this case, not new here. We crossed the, all of these borders quite a few times. And you kind of decide how you personally feel. And one good example is, so around the lake here, there is a section of the dirt, dirt that, to complete the sort of circuit around the lake that is, I don't know, like seven or eight kilometers of dirt. And it's kind of rough, but that's where they like come down from the mountains with machetes and guns. And like, and ordinarily in the past when we're just visiting a place, like people would tie stuff, and just kind of like, okay, I'm going, like, I'm not gonna, you know, respond to every concern of everybody. And yet, we once we sort of moved here and became, you know, sort of permanent fixtures. Of course, we uh, have never gone through that route, right? And when the BMW plug from Guatemala did, um, they took a an armed escort. So, like, you know, when you're kind of cruising through a place and you don't like that part of it, you tend to sort of I think, be a little less responsive to the like, scare. Part of a place and it's your home. You're like, oh my god, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. You can't go up that volcano because they'll attack you in that one. So it's like we try to, you know, stay stay calm and carry on, but not also be, be totally blind to adapt to what we're doing. It is exactly 11 a.m. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for watching. We are going to head out now. Um, I am anxious as hell about the exit because it is very rocky and I'm just concerned I'm going to go down. But we're not going to show that until you see. Uh, we're going to be filming it and then on next week's episode, no, not next week, the following two weeks, you will see our exit. And if I go down, you will see it there. Uh, but thank you all for watching. Uh, don't forget to donate if you can at goroughly.com slash world-adventure. Help us reach that $100,000 goal and keep in touch. You'll see on our landing page our route where we are. If we're coming near you and you want to see us, please reach out. We'd love to see you. Um, and thank you again. Welcome. Aww.